Hello, you've made it to This Week in Svelte. I am your co-host Enrico, and joining me is Paolo. Hi, everyone. Good day. And the agenda, as per usual, is a changelog, quick facts and announcements. We have a community showcase, followed by discussions and questions and answers. Let's get started. It's changelog time. All right, the chat is on screen, and the changelog starts with SvelteKit 1.22.4. And these are really small patches, very self-explanatory. Prevent duplicate module preload, or should I say, time to explain this changelog. Duplicate module preload, I think, was referring to the links in the header. Some For some reason, they were preloaded twice, but that's been patched. They're using the rail module preload strategy. I'll bring that on screen for... Yeah, basically, they preload uh, the, with the link. You can specify what you know that you will need, and uh, this module will be prefetched, right? Yeah, and I think the issue was some of these were duplicated, but no longer. So the module preload strategy okay. is back. Next, elaborate credentialed fetch behavior. For those of you using very advanced fetch headers, such as credentials include or credentials same origin. Now the credentials include method will behave as expected. And this is because Felkit wraps undici fetch and some of these considerations had to be made by hand. Yeah, okay. R asks, do we have imperative API for module preload? Imperative API, sort of. I, I don't think so. I don't know if you can override this Felkit provided strategies. I'm not aware, nor have I looked into this, but I can take a quick naive search, see if there's such a setting, but I don't believe so. Preload strategy. Options related to the build output. So by default, it's module preload, and it looks like preload JS and preload MJS are optional. So if by, if by imperative API you mean config, there's this. I'll post it in the chat. I don't know if there's a way to declare each module or each page as strategy, but if you're curious about that, maybe there's a GitHub issue. We can look into it another day. All right, next is Svelte 4.1.2. Allow child element with slot attribute within Svelte element. I tried to reproduce this, but it turns out this is a custom elements fix, not a Svelte fix. For example, I can't say it better than they did. When you're developing with slots like this one, here a Svelte element is being used and you can give it a tag name and give it a default slot. This works. It works in all versions of Svelte, but for some reason, compiling this to a custom web element had issues, but now that's been patched. Oh, that's really, really edgy, <laughs> like a super edgy case. <laughs> Kind of, but I, the component library maintainer has justified themselves because sometimes you want a custom Svelte element with a name slot or a default slot, and this would error for web components, but now it's been patched. So that's good. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's obviously uh, better to have been patched <laughs> than not. I was just very, I, I always curious, how do you find such uh, small edge cases? Yeah, well, if you throw enough people at it, uh, every edge case will come up eventually. <laughs> obviously, obviously. Next, data star SVG attributes work correctly. I don't think this is a web components patch, but a generic one by Paolo Ricciuti. I know you. Yeah, yeah, I know this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is something that I actually come, come on, <laughs> encountered. Like, uh, basically, uh, there was... Uh, you get a type error if uh, you try to pass uh, data slash something to an SVG because there was a missing type. And it's a very, very small PR, very cheap PR. Yeah, I just add one line of types, basically. Yeah, and uh, I guess a change set. So thanks for that. And yes. That's the change log. Let's move on to... Quick facts and announcements. 
how many facts can I provide today? So one of them is more of a question than a quick fact, and that is what is what are ES modules? I won't go deep dive into this. There are lots of better explained articles than this, but ES modules were sort of a modern standard introduced around 2017 for JavaScript because JavaScript for a long time has not had a proper module system. There were common JS modules in the past, such as the require statement. And I think when the ES modules were introduced, they used the new import syntax. And the key difference between the two is require is just in time and import is sort of pre-compiled. So for example, if you have a file that says import something from somewhere and you have another import, import my component from something that's felt. If this is how your imports are written, then Node.js will eagerly compile the imports. But if you use the old CJS syntax, the behavior would be different, such as require. And I see someone would like to speak on the stage. Come on down. Hello. Hi. So as I was saying, there's require. And if you had require statements like uh, const module equals require module, and you had a bunch of these at the top of your JavaScript file, they would be paused and loaded one by one. So they would not be eagerly compiled, but they would just load one at a time. Try your microphone again. We'll let you know if we hear you. And yeah, also, uh, uh, one, one other key difference is the fact that uh, being statically analyzed, uh, you can't uh, dynamically import something. I mean, now there is the dynamic import uh, way of doing it in an asynchronous way. But like with require, you could literally do if some condition equal true, then require module. And this is not possible with imports, but it's possible with dynamic imports. That's right. So the dynamic import, like um, import with parentheses, this returns a promise. So if you await it, you can sort of have the classic style of coding if something await import as you used to with uh, var equals require something. But the main question people were asking is, what are ES modules? How does this impact? global scope. And when you load a module in a JavaScript module, whether it's in Node.js or in the browser, they're not really global until they're imported in the file and then they're like accessible to that file. So if I were to do a module like this, and I'll bring up my code editor for better explanation. One more zoom. There we go. So I do import something from somewhere. Maybe my text editor will recognize this as JavaScript, and it does. Yeah. One, one more zoom. And then I do something. If I access something, this is available now to this file. I won't have access to this in the window document. So if I'm in a web browser and I do window.something, like a really global variable, this will not really work. So in, in Svelte and ES module projects like Svelte Kit and, and Vite and Node.js, this is the, the short, short version of like what are modules and how do they work. So that's all I'll say for now. Next. And also I think another important thing to say about modules is that whenever you import them, uh, all the file, all, all the code inside the module once per time, like if you import, the same module from two files, it would be still still executed once. Mm -hmm. By the way, uh, to our guest Ayub Coding, if you want to try your microphone again, now's a good chance. Otherwise, I don't think we can hear you, unfortunately. You can try rejoining the stage if you prefer. I have another quick fact. Quick fact number two. You can use JS, JS doc to type things in your markup. So for example, for those of you people who like to use TypeScript, 
we, we all like TypeScript, we can do that in our script tag, but we cannot do it in our markup. TypeScript syntax won't work here. So for example, uh, if I do like this statement here, I can't use a return type like colon string because the compiler doesn't recognize this syntax and it breaks. But you can use JS doc. So here in my button house, I am typing the cat event by preceding it with type detail name Tom, and this is a static event. So now when I hover it, I get my IntelliSense. JS doc does work in your markup. So if you want to type your markup, this is how you can do it. And I have a second example. This is really interesting. <laughs> yes. So down here, I gave myself, this is past Enrico saying, show everyone the as construct. Okay, I'll show you. So <laughs> we have a const person equals name string. But the name is written as peers. So when I do my IntelliSense here, I don't want it to be name string. I want it to be name equals peers. So you do JS doc at type const, but I'm not done. The secret sauce is you gotta ensure that the following statement is wrapped in parentheses. And this is the equivalent of TypeScript as const. So I have a unexpected token. That's probably my fault. Const person type const. Oh, that's correct. I think too many bra braces. Yeah, too many braces. No, I think. Uh, oh, I forgot uh, the last brace. It was a, a wrong, wrong order of braces. Okay, it's good now. So now when I hover name, it says peers. So this is the TypeScript as const syntax equivalent in JS doc. You just do type const and you wrap your following statement in parentheses. So you, this works in Svelte oh, markup. I, yeah, I didn't even know that you could do this in JS doc. Like it's it's always something that uh, I used to live by. Like whenever I had, I had, I had to, to write JS doc, uh, I always wanted as const and I didn't know that this was a thing. But yeah. uh, it, it, it's also much more interesting, the fact that you can type things in, uh, in JS doc inside the markup and does this works with typescript too like because if you if you're using typescript and not js doc to type your svelte files you even if there is a js doc uh, comment it does not recognize the type so does in does it does this inside the markup now if the question is can i use typescript uh, syntax in HTML in Svelte files? The answer is no. Since the Svelte compiler doesn't understand TypeScript today, you can't. However, because the TypeScript um, server is running, and lots of people already know this. If you're a TypeScript user, you've probably already run into this where you tried to type something in your markup and you know you can't. The solution is to use JS doc because the TypeScript server is running. JS doc will work because it's a fully compatible syntax because it's just comments. So if I uh, so if I did this as const like the um, like this, it won't work because this syntax is not supported. It's only only JavaScript is supported for now, so that's why the JS doc solution works in the HTML markup. Can Svelte let me use TypeScript in my CSS? Uh, I, I've seen some uh, open GitHub issues related to that. I don't have an answer though. Next quick fact is. VS Code extension command show compiled code. So hat tip to Sorella for showing this in the Q&A section on Discord. If you go to any Svelte file like this one, you can go command shift P and do Svelte show compiled code. And then this happens. Let me bring this in a better view. It's the compiled Svelte code, but I don't like the way it's shown in my editor. There we go. So now you can have a preview of what the Svelte compiler will output. This is the actual Svelte output of the page, and it's all built into your code editor. Pretty cool. And there's a couple of announcements. Yeah, this, this is... Go ahead, Paolo. No, I, mean, I was just saying that this is very cool because I also think that if you really want to shine in using a framework, uh, understanding the internals can really be beneficial. Like if you can 
look at the compiled code and understand why a Svelte component works, I really feel like you can shine in using Svelte. Indeed. Hey, everybody, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, right now, I fixed my mic. I just wanted to see a note about the ES modules. So, you, the ES modules, you can uh, lazy load them too. So when you're trying to use ES modules, you can lazy load them too. But common GS modules cannot. Okay. So let's see if we can break that down a bit. We're all familiar with, um, you have a function. And when you lazy load ES modules, you're supposed to do an async function and await yeah, an import. I think wait uh, the loading of the ES module, yes. Is this considered lazy loading? Yeah, I think it is. Like, um, if you. It will not load the module on, until you run the function. Yeah, so... and that's cool. Uh, if you want to save some space uh, for heavy applications, you can use lazy loading uh, not to load it so you don't put some heavy weight on the process when it goes. Yeah, lazy loading. And also, for example, for example, Vite, uh, if the module is just imported using uh, the await keyword, like if you all only dynamically import a module, uh, Vite will smartly enough create a different file for that yeah, module. Yeah, Vite. Vite, Vite is cool if you want to do lazy only. Yeah, I use Vite uh, for all my projects, uh, my simple projects about Svelte. I use Vite uh, in everything, in Svelte kit, in Svelte. Also in other frameworks. What if I do this? If I do the, the CGS require, this is also lazy imported, isn't it? Or depends on your builder. Yeah, I think uh, uh, is still lazy. Like it's not loaded when the main module load. But I think what uh, I was saying is that uh, obviously you this is synchronous uh, so whenever you hit that require it will wait until the module is loaded yeah and that's a kind of a good practice if you want to imagine you have a firebase uh, project that is really heavy you want to load some some stuff uh, until you call that function you can use lazy loading yeah that all makes sense thank you for sharing those details Already. Stay here if I want to do some uh, clarification about something that uh, you say uh, in the stream or something like that. Sounds good. So moving on, uh, just a couple of blogs to get by. Ross Rubino had shared about document components before my screen froze. And this is a really easy demonstration. You go to a component in your code base like my button house. And if you do add component in the HTML comment, you can write down the description of what the component does. Therefore, in your consumption of the component, hovering it will show you those comments. Here it says, my button house. I can also say, hello, this week in Svelte. Go back, and the comment updates. So there you can document your own internal components using at component and HTML comments. Check it out. If I haven't shared the blog already, I'll just share it again. More with obviously, that as every JS doc comment, you can use a proper markdown inside the JS doc comment to fancy <laughs> comment um, document your component. Yep, and one more. Yeah, that's a good practice. Indeed, one more article, which is a really nice one, by our fellow ambassador Stanley Slav Kromov. They wrote a guide on the missing guide to understanding adapter static in SvelteKit. And very detailed, almost exhaustive nuances are described in the article. Check it out. Things like if you're using adapter static, do note that the Vite dev server will not reflect what you'll get on production. Little nuances like that are fully described here. Please check it out. And that's it for okay. quick facts. 
Okay, let's move on to community community showcase. We have a special guest today. Please join us on stage. Well, hey, my name is Christian Erbe. Um, I'm a freelance full stack developer and uh, I'm the creator of uh, Throat, which is um, a framework and basically now like a kind of an ecosystem that uh, lets you write uh, or lay out and drive scenes in 3.js with the help of Svelte. So in a syntax that is native to Svelte in a way. Uh, and um, you, you can use, for example, properties, uh, just regular component properties, as you see in like this small example. Um, or you can use uh, Svelte's event handling to, to, for example, listen to clicks on certain things. And if you're kind of, I mean, uh, 3.js is a very popular framework. I guess some of you know it, maybe try it a little bit uh, with it. And um, for some reason, I think a lot of people just like this kind of um, working with 3.js a lot more because it's just closer to also, for example, apps that you would use to make um, 3D content like Blender, for example. And um, we just released Thread 6 four days ago. And um, this is the version six now of uh, Threads. And uh, I'm just going quickly over what changed because it, a lot has changed actually. And uh, I just wrote it down in this Twitter thread and I'm just going to uh, glance over it like, really quickly. Mm, now, as I said before, uh, Threads is um, a Svelte renderer for 3.js. What does that mean? It means that um, Threads itself doesn't really know about 3.js that much. It knows about certain concepts and it can use these concepts to um, offer you everything that 3.js has to offer in a declarative syntax. So there's really no limitation to it. Um, you can use really everything that 3.js has to offer. And uh, But you can use uh, properties like, for example, this position property, uh, Pierce property. So in this case, it's only uh, setting the, the C component of the Pro, uh, position property to the value of 10. Um, and you can use um, the, the C, like your uh, component hi hierarchy to lay out uh, 3JS scenes. Mm. And uh, why would you do that in the first place? I mean, it's just way easier to comprehend, especially if you're like building um, medium to large sized 3JS apps, it gets complicated really quickly in, in an Im imperative um, coding style. You just lose track of where you have to add and remove stuff. And um, so before Thread 6, we were not completely a 3JS renderer, but we also wrapped a lot of stuff and we ditched that completely. So I would consider Thread 6 to be the first real major version of Thread, which is kind of exciting for us. Also, uh, we introduced um, plugins. You, you see this, that these, this component T is, is, is there all the time. It basically does all the heavy lifting. And a plugin allows you to run code, oh, now run code inside of that T component, basically for every instance. And you can use it for, I don't know, create entity component systems, like in this example, or um, assign properties to every T component or something like that. But you can also use properties inside of a plugin. You can, you can use lifecycle mounts, everything basically. Um, we also now have like a little utility that lets you um, create Thread apps, which are basically Svelte apps, but then with all the configuration already uh, set up um, in a little interactive CLI that works basically just like the Svelte Kit CLI. So you're not, you're probably already familiar with that. And um, there is a, there's an awesome project, which is called uh, Theater.js. And it's, um, it's something that I think the JavaScript world has been long waiting for. And it's um, a JavaScript animation tool set, which allows you to make animations just as you would, for example, in After Effects keyframe based directly in your browser. And um, we already have an integration for that. And we basically, we've rewritten it from the ground, kind of. And the creator of, we are really proud that, for example, the pre creator of three, Theater.js uh, said that it provides the best API and developer experience currently available for, th for Theater.js. Um, 
On top of that, we have stuff like that your assets are cached application-wide. So when you are using the same texture twice, it only gets loaded once and then uh, it's, it's shared across all your application. And we have like a completely new website uh, with um, a beautiful landing page, of course. You cannot uh, not have that as a 3D framework and lots of examples and five packages that we are currently uh, offering. And um, as I said, we have this uh, theater package. And what I'd like to show you now is how to set up a really basic Thrilled app and how to integrate uh, theater.js into it and how to drive possibly, if I, can, if I still have the time, how to drive um, a, an animation that you have laid out in Blender with the help of uh, theater.js. So let's jump right in. Um, I'm using warp as my terminal. And this is the command, npm create Threlt, uh, just going to call it this week in Threlt. I'm a TypeScript guy. I'm sorry, Rich. Um, I don't like JS doc that much. And um, I'm going for these two. And now uh, this is the, the first Threlt specific um, question. I'd like to add extras, which is just uh, helpers and uh, other components on top of this T component. You probably want that in pretty much every project. And I'd like to show you theater and this model pipeline that automatically translates GLTF models, which is kind of a standard um, 3D content uh, format for the web to thread components. And no Git repository and not with NPM. No, this is wrong. And uh, now I'm using pnpm to install the dependencies. And I'm going to, oh, wait, this is wrong. Sorry. Now I'm going to open it in uh, VS Code. I hope I set up the, um, the screen dimensions so that you see something. I don't see that much in terms of screen real estate. It's not a lot. Still, um, if I'm now just running the development server, just as I would with any uh, Svelte Kit application, it goes through some steps of uh, optimizing dependencies. And um, I'm presented with this kind of default scene. Oh, that's already something, right? So I can move around by dragging. I have these uh, three things set up. There's a grid on the floor. And um, this is all in source lib components scene. The app is uh, a wrapper because this, this component provides context. We are making heavy use of the Svelte context API. And um, this one provides all the contexts that we need. So if we just um, move all of our stuff into like a child component, we can always be sure that the context is available. And inside of here, we see that um, this, is, this, is our, uh, this is the scene that we see. And I'm just going to take out this, all of this stuff for this presentation. It's not necessary to auto rotate. And you see that this that the grid that I'm seeing, I hope that you can see it. Maybe because of the compression, you cannot see it. Anyway, uh, there's like a, like a tiny grid on the floor and it fades away as soon as we move away with the camera. I'm just going to um, disable that too. And um, contact shadows, we don't need that for this presentation. I'm just going with, with a camera the orbit controls that allow me to rotate the camera with the, the help of my mouse uh, and two lights and this grid. You see that the grid, for example, is from the package thread extras, whereas everything else, no, not everything. This one is also extras, but everything else is um, made up from this, from this T component and is using 3JS um, classes directly. These ones, they, they wrap existing 3.js uh, classes and give us a little bit of extra um, comfort or uh, feature sets. And um, okay, so, but this is shaping up to be a Thread app. Now, um, I wanted to show you how to first, first I'll show you how the, the model pipeline works that I just installed. 
Um, a common workflow is that you have some form of model in uh, Blender. And in this case, I have this cube and it makes, uh, I just set up like a really quick um, animation. It jumps, uh, turns around 90 degrees and lands. And these are all transform. There's nothing fancy. It's not rigged. It doesn't, uh, there's no bones in here, nothing. Uh, one thing to notice that um, the mesh is called cube and the animation action is called jump. And if I now export that to static models, that's where all the models go. There's already a, a thread uh, file in here. We're just going to delete that one and um, check back into VS Code. Then we see that in static models, we have this cube now and uh, the thread file. We export it from Blender in this GLTF um, format. The standard, the standard settings are fine most of the times. Now there is um, an additional package script which is called model pipeline run. And you can actually uh, check out the script. It's part of your repository if you set it up with NP uh, npm create thread. Uh, you have a couple of um, options how that now works and uh, did that work? Oh, sorry. Yep, it worked. Um, and this script, for example, um, yeah, what does this uh, script do? It uses this uh, GLB uh, file and creates a thread component from it. Um, why would you want that in the first place? Uh, in regular or like in vanilla, um, 3JS applications, when you load a GLTF file, it's kind of opaque. It's its own little package that you, that you import and you don't really see what is in there. You uh, don't really see what kind of animations are in there. And uh, there's mm, not a lot of ways to uh, yeah, actually edit what is in the GLTF file. And uh, this allows you to edit basically everything that comes with the GLTF file and also inspect it. So for example, we see that one node is uh, uh, being imported, which is uh, called cube, just as we called it in, in Blender. And you also see that there's an animation action, which is called jump, also just as we um, named it in Blender. Now, uh, using it is fairly simple. We just um, go into our scene again and we import the cube. Okay, here it is. I mean, it's not a lot, but it's there. Um, how would we just play the animation first that is in there? Because that's, that's uh, what I wanted to show you in the first place. You see here that we are using this hook, use GLTF uh, animation. And um, this GLTF um, variable is a store that gets uh, populated as soon as the model is loaded. And because we pass it onto this uh, hook, the animation actions are being populated as soon as this GLTF store is populated. So we can actually check out um, what's in this uh, action store. And you see that there is um, that it's a map and it's, um, it has got this animation action, which is called jump. And it's also TypeScript, so uh, enabled, so we can just, uh, we get this kind of um, autocomplete. And now you can already see that we have an, the animation back in here. So this uh, little operator um, checks if jump is available. And uh, we are using that to only play the animation as soon as the action store is actually populated. And this one is only populated when the GLTF file is loaded. So this is kind of the it's very, it's very small in terms of line size, but a lot of stuff is going on here. And um, okay, now the idea is to show you also how we can drive the, the, this animation with uh, the help of uh, Theater.js. Um, so this is, this is what we're starting out at. And Theater.js um, and the, the Theater.js package comes with um, a component. Oh, nice. 
which is called theater. And it's kind of a shortcut. It gives us um, everything that we need to work with uh, theater just with one component. You see that there's all of a sudden uh, a little bit of extra UI on our website. This is uh, the so-called theater studio. And um, unfortunately, it, it doesn't, it, it's not named, but this is a default project that has been set up for us by this theater component. There is a default sheet. A sheet is kind of an organizational layer of uh, Theater.js that has been set up for us. It's called, also called default. And um, we can actually just start using Theater.js now inside of our application. That's as easy as it is. Um, now, what I want to do is, the idea is to tie uh, Theater.js into our anima into the rest of our animation system, into the rest of the theater of the 3JS animation. And the way we do this is by uh, using the um, component sheet object of the Threld theater package. Now it's complaining that it's a, missing a key, so we're giving it that, I just called it cube. And you see that now we have this, um, this sheet object. This is a sheet object. It's an object on the sheet default. Um, called cube, but it doesn't have any properties. Uh, so we can, uh, for our example, we just give it props directly on here. And uh, we'll, we'll uh, want to have the property, uh, what do we call it, animation progress. And um, this is now something a little bit more involved, but uh, theater Theater.js comes with a little utility to create these properties. And I'll just show you in a second why we want that. Um, this is a little bit of boilerplate, I'm sorry. Um, so we are creating the property animation progress as a number with the initial value of zero. And it is always in the range of zero to one. Now, there is already, ah, yeah, okay, okay, okay. I have to, I have to rename that. Sorry, because local storage. Um, Cubex. So there is now a little bit of um, UI on here. Oh, I'm getting a. Ah, yeah, I'm sorry. So there is now a little bit of UI on here, which is called animation progress. And you see that it's kind of a range slider that goes from zero to one, just as we wanted. And now we have to hook this slider up to the animation progress of our cube. How would we do that? First of all, we go into the cube and um, we are getting rid of this kind of stuff because this is, uh, this is actually not how we do it now. I'm sorry, I, I should have uh, modified the pipeline first. Anyway, um, we are setting up uh, just a regular property and we call it, we just call it animation uh, progress for the sake of clarity. And um, we are using, we are using um, a regular reactive, uh, um, Svelte reactive statement to first check if, um, if the actions, if the action, if the animation action jump is defined. So actions jump. We put that in an if statement. Um, for, uh, then this is something that um, this is something that just uh, is necessary for three js. We we if it's not running, if the animation is not running, we play it. But also we immediately want to pause it. So. Uh, because we, we want it to adhere to the, to, to the value that we're passing it in. And then we are setting up the uh, time to be the animation progress times the length of the clip. And by that, if let's, for, uh, let's say the clip is two seconds long and we are um, 
multiplying that by a number between zero and one, we always uh, are in between like the beginning and the end of the of the animation. And just like that, we are ready to pass in our animation progress value into the cube components. Now, how do we get that value out here? We use the slot syntax to get a property called values, a slot property called values. And um, that one is, is reactive. So we can pass the animation progress property and use this uh, values slot prop. And you also see that it's automatically typed. So values is, uh, is also correct type, correctly typed by, by this uh, object. Um, now that doesn't work. Of course it doesn't work. Can you spot the error? I can't. Animation progress. That works. Jump. Oh, sorry. Okay, now this is a method. So now you can see from zero to one, we hooked up this animation to a property in Theater.js. Now, how can you animate that? Because uh, this is kind of the whole point of uh, Theater.js. Um, you can animate that uh, by right-clicking on here and uh, setting, setting up a sequence. And a sequence is um, a sequence just as you have sequences in After Effects, in Blender and everything. Um, so you have like a, a dope sheet down here, and that's what uh, you would normally call that. And you set up a keyframe at the very beginning of the sequence. And let's say, at, uh, I don't know, like two seconds, I think it was in, um, in Blender. And just like that, when you press um, space, it plays the animation that we initially laid out in Blender. Uh, you can think of se several use cases for that. Normally, for example, in la larger projects, you get these kind of animations and m m models by someone who professionally does 3D modeling and animation. So um, maybe they would like to see animations that they did in Blender in their, uh, on a website, and then it's just easier for you to, to kind of sync up maybe other animations that you want to do in Theater.js this way. Um, also, it just shows how you can mix and match these kind of tools together to, to get the best workflow you can, you can imagine. Now, how would I now use this to, to kind of tie it in into like a, another animation? Um, if I go back to that scene, um, this is where I place the cube. And I'd, now I'd like, I'd like to have an effect underneath the cube that when the cube from, on the way down hits the ground, there's like a little bit of a, you know, like a, a ring that kind of um, uh, expands. I can use the T component and create a new mesh. I can use the ring geometry from uh, 3JS. And um, a mesh is always made up from a geometry and a material. And in this way, you declare these. And uh, you see it down here. But we all, we all, uh, you already see that it's uh, rotated incorrectly. And this is because we have to rotate it on 90 degrees on the X axis. And yeah, now it's there. We cannot, we just cannot see it because it's uh, on top of the, on top of, uh, underneath the cube. Um, now that, now it's something really fancy. Um, we can add additional properties to this sheet object cube X by using components that the sheet object is giving us as slot props. So um, there's this component called transform and it, uh, it adds transform properties. Oh, yeah, okay, now. It adds transform properties, so position, rotation, and scale to our sheet object. And now you can use, for example, this thing to move the, move the ring around. 
and you see that the values are reflected here. Um, actually, I think it would be better to call it ring transform. So uh, this is, the key needs to be alphanumeric. So it's ring transform with a label of ring transform. And now we and now it's like grouped underneath ring transform. And uh, now something even more magic maybe. There is another component that we get, which is called sync. And the sync component can use properties from its parent to sync it up with the theater.js component. So in 3.js, if you want to make something transparent or even half transparent, you have to provide the flag transparent. And we want to uh, sync the, the opacity property of the material with theater.js. And you see that now I can, I can um, control the opacity of this object right in theater.js. Um, so when it hits the ground, we want to have, yeah, have a transpar uh, tr opacity of zero, scale of one, and um, over time, more opacity and a little bit larger. Mm. Then again, it should also, again, be less visible. Now, of course, this is not like a very uh, ring. Is that ring? Ring geometry? Isn't that the one? Anyway. Uh, now, of course, the animation can be way better, but you already see that that the benefits of having these kind of systems overlapping and also controlling each other are really uh, beneficial. Yeah, so this is kind of the, the, the end of the presentation. I hope, I mean, it was probably a little bit too much for s some people because uh, not everyone is accustomed to 3JS, but I hope that you gained a little bit of insight of, of why we do that project and why it's kind of a big deal also for my professional practice. Uh, it's just so much easier to 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 bring stuff to life. And um, as I said, 15 people contributed over 90, uh, 900 commits over uh, at the span of eight months. So we are really released about uh, We are really excited about that release. And um, if you want to contribute, go to Threads XYZ. Uh, we are also uh, we also have a very lively Discord community. Really happy about that. And um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much for presenting. Everyone give a hand to our speaker. I will be sure to share Threlt and the Threlt Discord in the YouTube description below. And that was really nice. I like how easy Threlt makes it to import geometry from Blender and to have a compile step to build it into Svelte components. Like that to me was pretty magical. Uh, I agree. <laughs> Wonderful. So thank you. Like a is there like an effect or like is there like a q a now or uh unfortunately we're out of time but if you can check oh, out the sorry. discord chat and i think uh Sorella had a question further up you can always reply to them asynchronously and if anyone has any threat specific right. support questions there is a threat discord check out the links and we'll catch you next time thank you so much yeah thanks for having me bye see ya and maybe there's time for a question and answers period so let me pass it off to Paolo. Yeah, I was preparing uh, uh, a small demo in Svelte Lab, which I kind of, uh, I want to show uh, something uh, that I worked on, which I think is pretty cool. Um, and basically uh, I will share my screen and, and we can live code it. So uh, basically there, there might be some times uh, where uh, you want to show uh, a component and maybe it's a fancy input like for example a range slider or something that actually does not exist in uh, regular html so you need javascript to make it work uh, but at the same time this is kind of a bad experience for um, 
it's kind of a bad experience for accessibility because if the only way you have to uh, set a value, for example, is through JavaScript, well, that that will not work. But at the same time, you don't want to forego the fanciness of that when you will have JavaScript enabled. And so what I come up with is, uh, in my opinion, quite quite cool component, which is called noSSR.svelte. And this is a very, very simple component that basically allows you to show a fallback, a completely different fallback whenever JavaScript is not enabled. And uh, we kind of can, we can kind of do that with no script, but uh, this, uh, th that will not exactly work. Uh, so basically this is an abstraction that allows you to do so. And uh, the way it works is it makes use of a weight, which is a block in Svelte. And the, the, the way it works is that you await a promise that just instantly return. So you can just uh, create a basic async function that does nothing. Uh, and you can insert your uh, fallback here. So you have slot name equal fallback. And, and then you can have a normal slot here. And you have to separate these with uh, then. So what it does is that if uh, if there is JavaScript enabled, it will immediately go to the then. And if there's no JavaScript enabled, it will be stuck to to this uh, to this lot. And this way, for example, if I import this from no SSR, no SSR, you can quickly do no SSR and I have to restart the dev server. And this means that I can normally pass my fancy JavaScript input, for example, but I can also provide, for example, a normal button that will be used when JavaScript is not enabled. So normal button. And as you can see, this button gets not rendered, um, but it will be rendered uh, if we disable JavaScript. So if we open these in the split view um, and we, I mean, it's the dev server stopped. Well, I see the normal button, so it works. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but what I was uh, trying to show is that if you disable JavaScript here, come on. and try to refresh the page again. I mean, it crashed again, but this is a normal button. So uh, you can basically show uh, a fancy that only works with JavaScript uh, form element uh, when JavaScript is enabled. And if JavaScript is not enabled, you get a boring, plain old HTML uh, boring plain old HTML uh, form control. And while I was also writing this, uh, it it got to me that you can also just use on mount for doing this and you don't need to do this complicated stuff. But I tested it and actually this runs before the on mount. So it's a bit better because you get, when JavaScript is enabled, you get the actual content before the on mount. Very cool. Can you please zoom in a bit to the no SSR component? So it's cool Sorry? that just zoom in a bit. Yeah. Oh. I see that you're returning an immediately returned async function that satisfies yeah. the await. And it looks like during SSR, they respect that. They're like, okay, I'll show you the, 
fall back first. You can even do promise dot resolve. Yeah, or return exactly. You can pass in a resolves promise. Very cool. Yeah, I mean it's useful. There are some uh, uh, form elements that uh, require JavaScript for them to be fancy, like a range slider, because we don't have a range slider yet in in, in HTML. Uh, but uh, uh, rely only on them without having a fallback. Uh, it's a bit practice because then without JavaScript, your user cannot submit your form. Awesome. I will share my screen now and wrap things up. And that was questions and answers. How do I render something when JavaScript's not enabled? Paolo showed you how. And that is it for this week in Svelte. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. See you next Friday.